So welcome again to everybody. I'm going to give you a quick introduction to the uh, technology side of stuff. And then Marshall, my co-presenter, will introduce the presentation um, on your go to webinar toolbar on the right side of your screen. You'll find um, Marshall, will you do us the the favor of introducing uh, tonight's presentation and letting, uh, letting folks know what we're getting into? Thanks, Michael. I'd be delighted to. So um, I would like to welcome everybody to, as Michael said, Planning for Board Leaders Succession, um, a webinar um, and um, a webinar produced by the Cooperative Board Leadership Development. And uh, we're part of CDS Consulting. Um, and we'll tell you a little bit more about that in a while. Let's talk first about um, who's here. Um, there, are, there are two of us who will be presenting. Um, my name is Marshall Kovitz. I'm a C-Build consultant. I'll be one of the, the presenters. And um, Michael Healy, whom you just heard from, will be the other presenter. Michael, do you want to say hi again? Hi, this is Michael here. Great. Um, another person um, who um, you'll be hearing from is Mark Goring. Mark is also a C-Build consultant. He's our tech support. He's also the coordinator of our team. And um, 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 Mark will also be talking a little bit and uh, talking about some of the substance and also perhaps helping us with, with some of the tech questions. Um, Mark, do you want to say hi? Hello. Terrific. Um, we have some other guests as well, and we'll introduce them more formally in a very, very short while. Mary, Mary Pat, and Carolyn are board leaders, and um, they'll be participating as we talk about about our topic. And as I say, we'll we'll introduce them very shortly. Um, next, if I could, I'd like to talk very, very briefly about uh, the Seabuild program, and we have a slide there that's entitled Seabuild Program Overview. Um, uh, Michael, Mark, and I are all part of CBUILT. CBUILT is, of course, Cooperative Board Leadership Development, a, a program of cdsconsulting.coop. And I think you can see on the slide to our website. Um, uh, CBUILT is a, is a program designed to provide ongoing support for uh, the boards of directors of food co-ops. And um, it consists of a number of different parts. I'd like to just go over those really briefly, if I could. Um, first, of course, you know what you're listening to are the online recorded workshops. Um, these are presented about uh, regarding various topics, and um, uh, along with the field guide, which is another online resource, you can find these in um, in the Seabuilt library. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. Another important part of the CBUILD program is the CBL 101. These are in-person multi-co-op trainings designed especially for new board members, although they're great for present board members and for the general managers. We do the CBL 101s at various times during the year <coughs> and in various places around the country. Um, another very important part of the CBUILD program is um, a, 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 a full-day planning and facilitation retreat um, where we cover issues that are, are of importance to, the, uh, to, to your board. And finally, last but not least, um, as part of our program, we provide ongoing consulting hours um, for support of the board throughout the year, once again dealing with the issues that are important to you. Um, I want to mention just briefly the Seabuilt Library. You can see the, uh, the, uh, the link for that. Seabuilt Library is where you'll find the um, online recorded workshops that we've done thus far, as well as the field guides. And um, not only are the actual recordings there, but all of the documents associated with it as well. And uh, these are available to all of the, the board members um, who are part of the Seabuilt program. So, Sorry, Marshall. I just accidentally slipped that to the next slide. Oh, no, that, that, that's fine, Michael. Thanks. I was, I was actually just about to, to go on to that. Um, let's talk about some of the outcomes that we're, you know, we're hoping to achieve here, um, because it's very important. You know, we feel that you take away certain things um, from this um, 
um, online recorded workshop. Number one, uh, participants understand why it's important to have effective, an effective board leader. We feel that board leadership is essential for smooth board functioning, and we'll explain more about that in a while. So this is really a necessary part of your governance work. Um, participants know what to look for in effective board leaders. Well, you know, um, what are the characteristics we're concerned with? How do we find those who are best suited to the job? Um, we'll go over those as well. Um, participants understand the importance of having a plan for a board leader's succession. Failure to plan sometimes leads to unexpected and sometimes unpleasant surprises. And of course, we want to avoid this. Having a plan will help us do that. Um, participants have the resources for creating and implementing the board leader succession plan. This won't be hard to do um, with the tools and the resources that we'll present. This is not a terribly complicated um, um, process. And um, you know, using the, the ideas that Michael and I and um, the other presenters will offer, you can come up with a really good plan um, without a great deal of difficulty. So um, those are our outcomes. We'll review those again at the end to ensure that we've talked about everything and ensure that people don't have any, any other questions. So let's now go to the next slide and um, have Michael do some introductions Thanks, for our Marshall. guest panelists. All right. Um, just want to let folks know that we have um, two very special guests here tonight to share their experiences as board directors and board leaders, uh, and we're going to draw on their, their insights, their wisdom, their experience throughout the, the uh, presentation. Um, so Carolyn, would you quickly just introduce yourself, let us know uh, where you're from, a little bit about your, your co-op board um, and your experience on the board? Sure. Yeah, my name is Carolyn, and I live in Lawrence, Kansas, and I am part of the Community Mercantile Co-op here. I have been um, the board leader, board president for the last, well, just couple months now. I'll be board leader for the for the coming year. Um, what what else was it, Michael, that you wanted? Um, just real quick, what your your experience on your board has been? Um, well, we are we're a seven member board, and um, in terms of board leadership succession. Um, I was asked um, after my first year of being on the board to become vice president for a year um, with the intention then of becoming president for my third year. So that is where, where I'm currently at, is just embarking upon being board president now. Nice. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for being here. Yeah. Um, and Mary Pat, could you do a quick uh, introduction of yourself, your co-op, and your experience on your board? Yes, um, we're uh, in the Marquette Food Co-op, and we're up in the Marquette, Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula. And uh, I am on a nine-member board. I am currently in my seventh year, which will be my last year. Um, we have six-year limits, but because we changed from two to three-year terms, I ended up with an extra one. Um, I was president for three of those years, and I just left the presidency in June. Um, and I'm serving out my last year as just a uh, general board member. And um, that's where we kind of worked into um, trying to find who was going to be president. After I left, we set up a president-elect office. Nice. And so Mary Pat is going to tell us a little bit more about that process and how it's worked for them in a few minutes. Um, so again, welcome Carolyn and Mary Pat, and thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Mm -hmm. um, sure. What I wanted to do here as we begin the uh, workshop is to step back from some of the, the details of succession and remind all of us um, that leadership makes a difference um, and to recognize that if we begin with the assumption that leadership makes a difference, then we can also move from there to understanding why maintaining leadership through succession plans makes a difference. Um, one of the things that I've come to recognize over uh, many years of working with boards is that, um, and maybe I, I knew this 
from other experiences also, and, and probably the rest of us out here recognize this, that groups of people are inherently crazy, right? We're, we're, <laughs> um, you, you've got a, a unit, a being, um, that has seven or nine or more brains, that many different ideas and, and wills trying to function as one. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, you know, if, if that were a single person with that many different uh, personalities, you know, we would be um, looking for psychiatric help. But groups function that way all the time. Boards are just inherently crazy. And what keeps us from being, what keeps us from totally disintegrating into, uh, into the, the, the ether is a sense of, of centeredness, a sense of, of somebody or some bodies keeping us together, maintaining a center, maintaining a direction for us. And in boards, uh, generally it is the president or the chair who we ask to fulfill that role for us. Somebody who reminds us, somebody in our group who always reminds us we are a group, we have to work together as a group, that we aren't just uh, a random assortment of individuals. So the, the president, we're going to use the term president throughout this presentation, but in, in your own co-op that might be a chair or it might be, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of the different terms I've heard, but we'll, we'll just stick with president. Um, somebody on the, on the board who has agreed to look towards the wholeness of the group, who will pay attention to keeping us disciplined, who will make sure that we have a plan and follow a plan, who will pay attention to that long-term direction and ability of the group. Maybe everyone on the board should be doing that anyway, but we ask a president, a chair, to do that for us in particular. So we go from that leadership matters, and it matters for good reasons, um, then we move into why would it matter if we have a succession plan? Now, most co-op boards um, are, uh, for better and for worse, um, democratically elected groups of people, and terms for many boards are limited, and even for those who don't have term limits, um, the, the directors are volunteers who take on this role as a service to their cooperative for a limited period of their life. And uh, for whatever reason, most of us who serve on boards after a few years leave the board and, and let someone else take over that role. The same is true for board presidents. Now, some board presidents uh, that I've worked with um, stick around for, for many, many, many years. Um, but it's very likely that on your board, a board president would be present for a few years at most. So we should expect for, uh, we should plan for uh, turnover. If we don't have a succession plan, then if it's the board president that leaves, um, if that's the board member who, who's leaving the board, then we have a, we have a gap, we have a, a disruption. If, if we go back to that idea that the president is the person holding our center and keeping an eye on the long-term plan, um, then we have a moment there in between one president and another where the board doesn't have a center or doesn't have someone holding the center, doesn't have someone keeping an eye on the long-term plan. Those disruptions are always survivable. Um, plenty of boards um, have times where there's not a clear leader and we, we flounder or we coast for a while and then we get back on track. So it's not like that's the end of the world. But if we're trying to create high-functioning cooperative boards around the country, boards that are uh, really making a difference in the community by serving the cooperative in this way, um, we don't really want to disrupt that. We don't really want to create uh, scenarios where we're going to lose our momentum. So we at the board level should be thinking of our own leadership succession, just as we might think about it for the operational succession. We, we would not want to leave our, our cooperative business in the lurch if a GM uh, left uh, that job. So in the same way, we wouldn't want to leave our board in the lurch uh, if and when our president leaves. So from the perspective of all directors as leaders, but in particular from the perspective of uh, board 
presidents, we don't want to just assume it'll all work out in the, in the end. We want to um, take some proactive, uh, make some proactive decisions, uh, create some some uh, plans for us to continue moving forward. So that's a quick um, overview <coughs> of why leadership matters and why the succession plan matters. Um, before I move on into the um, specifics of how we'd like to encourage people to think about leadership and succession, um, I just want to check real quick, um, first with Marshall and then with Carolyn and Mary Pat, if you have any quick insights about um, the, these general concepts about uh, leadership uh, and succession. Marshall, what do you think? I think you've covered it. I think you've covered it well, Michael. Right, well, thanks. Um, Carolyn, what would you like to add to, to this introduction? Um, I think that um, what's been helpful looking through this webinar is um, really realizing how important a succession plan is and not just leaving it up to chance. <laughs> and so um, I think it's as we go through this, I think it'll be more and more clear about, um, again, having a really strong plan for, for your board in terms of um, president leadership roles. I think it's yeah. really important. Yeah. Good. So just reaffirming them. We don't want to leave it to chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mary Pat, any, any other thoughts you want to add to this as, before we move along? Well, I really agree with Carolyn in looking through these uh, slides beforehand and so on. Um, I realize how far we have yet to go as you mm -hmm. know, trying to see who would be a good leader and grooming leader. We're just kind of started okay. to punt, actually. And we're learning as we go, but um, the whole thing of um, effectiveness and discipline and building, I see it as very important. And I think that um, I totally agree with those four points right there. Mm -hmm. All right, I think well, it's covered. If we're all in agreement, we might as well just keep moving forward, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. One of the things that um, Marshall and I, as we were putting these ideas together, um, we wanted to, um, we, we thought, well, what, what, what would make a good board leader? And then we realized that um, most of what we've already been encouraging for directors in general holds true for board leaders. Um, uh, in a previous online workshop, um, Perpetuating a Strong Board, Marilyn Scholl and I uh, talked about some of the qualities that uh, boards might want to look for in uh, directors uh, as you're out there doing your recruitment work. And I'd like to encourage anyone who hasn't checked out that information to, to go to the library and, and uh, look at some of those materials. Then we're thinking about what is it that's different about um, a board president um, that we might want to add to that list. And uh, Marshall and I started thinking about um, the, this idea of servant leadership. And uh, this is a concept that uh, uh, Robert Greenleaf put together many years ago. And uh, his... his uh, books, articles on the topic are very informative. Um, I wanted to do a quick overview of this idea of servant leadership, and then I'm going to uh, go back and ask uh, Carol and you and Mary Pat and Marshall, from your perspective as, as board leaders and directors, um, how you think this manifests uh, for uh, folks on the board. So in uh, oftentimes, uh, we think of boards as being a servant leader for the cooperative. Um, and within the board, uh, the board president, uh, we could often think of as a servant leader for the board itself. Um, and, and in uh, Robert Greenleaf's uh, writing and, and uh, formula, he says, you know, the servant leader starts first, uh, begins with that desire to serve. And, and being willing to serve then leads us to agree to or aspire to lead. Um, that we lead in order to serve. Um, a servant leader wants to help the, the group that we are leading grow. We want to help the people in the group grow. Um, 
this is something that uh, is a little different than thinking of the board president as the person who gets to be in charge so that they can get their way, or the person who uh, gets to be leader so that their own their own agenda can be furthered, um, or so that they can have more power because that's fun. Um, any of those things might be true for for different people at different times, but. We, Marshall, I really want to encourage uh, folks to consider this idea that the board president should be leading because uh, of their desire to serve the board. So with that in mind, both the idea of servant leadership and, and just general um, qualities that we think might be useful in, for any director, I'm curious, um, Mary Pat, if, if you have thoughts from, from your own experience uh, as a board leader or from seeing other people in that position, what do you think m are some of the things we would want to look for um, or maybe hope for in a, in a board president? Hmm. Well, with our board specifically, I can say that what we really need is somebody who um, really follows up and is disciplined to um, make sure that things that everybody follows through on what they commit to. We've always had trouble with people committing to things or doing a committee and then it kind of gets forgotten. This was our history. So if we have somebody who is actually kind of, you know, making sure that everybody is fulfilling the commitment that they make, that's been really important for us. Well, it's interesting. So both the, the board president themselves should be someone who can follow up, but then also who can pay attention to that and help other Correct. people do the same thing. Uh -huh. And, you know, the, the really good um, kind of like organizing skills, I think, is, is really essential. Uh-huh. Yeah, definitely. Um, Carolyn, what do you think from, from what your experience, what makes a good board leader? Well, just as Mary Pat was saying, I would um, completely agree with that. Um, trying to find the balance between holding people to a high standard and, and board discipline, like you were saying, Mary Pat, um, follow mm -hmm. through and, and um, people doing as they say they, they will and participating. And then on the other side, also getting out of the way a bit, <laughs> not being too controlling, if you will, um, like you were saying earlier, Michael. Um, just um, being, being more allowing of, of, the group, of the group process and not trying to control it too much. Um, I really love the idea of, I love the word of, of servant. I love combining it with servant leadership. I think that's just really um, a, a great way to look at what, what board presidents have to offer in terms of, you know, um, giving both guidance and, and wisdom to the, to the full board. So. It's interesting that you combine this idea of really um, asserting or, or pushing for discipline, holding people to a mm -hmm. high standard, mm -hmm. but not controlling. Mm -hmm. That seems like that would be a really hard balance to maintain. Mm -hmm. um, th do you have any uh, insight on, on, on how that happens? How, do, how does a, a board president maintain both those qualities? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of it is through example. Um, I think in, in the past when I've seen board leaders follow through on what they say they're going to do or you know you're going to come to a meeting and they're going <laughs> to really ask you about the things that you had said that you were going to do. I think really setting a, an example is a big piece of it. Um, and I also think, um, so I think probably for the most part that's what I've noticed um, with our past two presidents since I've been on the board. Um, is just through through example, and so now that I'm board president, I'm trying to do that piece as well of you know following through and 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 also being accessible to people who have questions or concerns, and um, but also following up with people, make sure they do things that they say they will. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And. And Michael, I, I guess you know to add perhaps <coughs> another layer to <coughs> what makes a um, a good board leader is is also um, examining the larger context, which in you know in our case is usually the board agreements 
um, being able to understand the agreements that the board has already laid out. In some cases, we may call them rules. In other cases, depending on the board, we'll call them policies. But to be able to use these um, agreements as a context for our work and to always be able to, to keep those in mind because those are, you know, those are the rules that we've agreed to, to use until now, or, or through now. Good, yeah, thanks for adding that in, Marshall. It's one of the things that uh, earlier when you and I were talking about um, what we would suggest, that was here on this slide, we see we've suggested that as one of the half dozen or so critical attributes that if the board president understands what the board has already agreed to, and then can regularly remind the rest of us, hey, this is what we've agreed to. This is, this is what we're doing here. Um, that is a very powerful tool for helping a board maintain that center, maintain our, our sanity as a, as a group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned uh, being able to look at uh, sort of the, the bigger picture. Um, one of the things we've mentioned on this particular slide is, is someone who might themselves identify important issues and bring them to the board. So we, we, we would hope that anyone on the board as a director could do that, but in particular a board president should be aware of that stuff, of what is it out there in the world or in our own process that we should be paying attention to, what will really make the most difference. Yeah, yeah. You know, one other thing I might <coughs> mention, um, Michael, I don't know if you've noticed this, um, but I've had <coughs> a few boards who've actually spent a little time um, in discussions discussing just the idea of servant leadership, discussing the context, the concept, and talking about what it means to them specifically about their work as, in, in leadership, both as a board and what, what they expect of, of, of their board president. So actually having a, you know, a, a deeper discussion about the concept um, in, in some cases has been, been helpful for some boards, too. You know, that's a really great idea, Marshall. Let, let's see if we can remember to mention that again, because later on in our workshop we're going to talk about um, a, a, a process. We're, we're just going to suggest um, a way to think about how either the board leader or the board as a whole could imagine the, the regular annual cycle of planning for succession. And maybe one part of that would be um, a, a periodic uh, educational uh, topic about succession and maybe talking about servant leadership and what it means and what we hope for and expect from a board president. Good point. Yeah. Um, before I, I go too much further here, I just want to check in. Um, Mark, did you have any questions that uh, you wanted to feed into the conversation before we keep going? No, I think the questions that we have are going to be more appropriate for a little bit later. Great. Thank you. Um, one of the things I, w I wanted to ask, um, uh, in particular, uh, Mary Pat and Carol, and the two of you who have either recently been a board leader or currently are, um, was this last uh, kind of funny um, statement here that w that the board leader, the board president, should have enough time to do the job, but not too much. Uh, and I wonder if either of you, um, you know, that makes me smile when I think of that. Uh, and uh, I wonder if either of you have a thought on what it would mean to have enough but not too much time. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, um, Carolyn, maybe you first. What do you think that is about? Mm -hmm. I think um, I've, ha I've heard stories of um, other board members, you know, from their people, of people who did have too much time to devote to board work, and it um, I think it created possibly more work for people than they were prepared to take on. Um, now, do you mean created more work for the other directors? For the other directors. Uh -huh. And um, maybe created, um, these are just stories of, that I heard, just, um, you know, just a little bit more... Um, I don't know what the right word is. Um, maybe just more chaos, or um, not not such a great group group dynamic. Because I think the people who um, gave a lot expected that much from other people as well, and so then there there created a lot of tension between people who were giving a lot to the board and then what they perceived that people who didn't have quite as much time what they were giving to the board. And again, I think that created some tension for people. 
Uh-huh. So, so maybe being able to have realistic expectations from the leadership position also means that you don't expect too much of yourself or, or that you have to recognize not everyone has that amount of time. Yeah. Right. Um, Mary Pat, is this something that has ever come up in conversation for you or your board? Um, actually, a lot of this it made me laugh because when I came on as president, I had just retired from a job, a rather stressful job, so I ended up having quite a bit of time. And in some aspects, perhaps I did have too much time because I find myself, we did need a lot of structure. We were working without written agendas and we were just kind of floundering. So in a way, it was fortunate I had the time to set, you know, to come up with some systems and do the footwork. But at the same time, at certain times, people would pull me back because it was like, well, we don't really want this to be a job. You know, we have this many of hours. So um, at times, I was actually guilty of that, I think. And um, But my board was not shy about telling me to get back. <laughs> and and even with some board members now, we, we have an occasional board member, you know, people who love detail and who want to spend a lot of time doing things or researching or going into certain directions and everybody else just kind of says, we, we don't have time to do that. So they're good at that, but I really can understand that statement and um, see that, yeah, the expectations you have then everybody else feels like Carolyn said that they're not meeting them then and that can add, that can lead to some conflict I think mm -hmm. so, so so just uh, again these are are there's no real if, if we all knew exactly what it took to be a good leader um, you know the world would be a very different place I don't think we can say exactly so these are just some guidelines some ideas to keep in mind uh, for you for your own board what what might help someone be a good board president? So this, this is a good starting place for that conversation for those sort of questions. Mm -hmm. One of the things um, we, if, if we're thinking about succession plans, somewhere in there, someone, um, hopefully uh, at least the board president, or maybe others are beginning to identify who are the people who either do have or who might have some of those qualities we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, what I think would be very helpful is if, um, Mary Pat, you could explain your own experience for your board, how you all went about um, identifying, um, choosing the, the board leader, the board president who followed you. Um, and then maybe Carolyn, after that, you would explain, since you are the more recent becoming the board president, explain how someone identified you, what they, were, what they did, said, um, to help you uh, think about becoming a future board president. Mm -hmm. um, so Mary Pat, how did your board go about um, identifying the person who took your role, your, your president's role when you stopped being president? Um, well, actually it was pretty simple. Uh, no one wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. And I had basically said I will serve one more year on one, with one stipulation, and that is that somebody will commit to running next year because I don't want to be, I would otherwise I know feel like I needed to stay on and I was pretty much ready to step down um, there were a couple people there there was one person that I thought would make a great board president who was not interested and um, nobody really I think they and this is maybe where having too much time might have led to this they saw the amount of work I was putting in mm -hmm. and I think that in a way that deterred a lot of people from thinking I just can't do this uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, and so we had one person who said, sure, I'll try it, and that's how we came up with him as our president-elect. He has, in the meantime, started to delegate and hand out work, you know, in ways that I didn't. So hopefully the next time this happens, people will, you know, maybe say, hey, this might be a good position. I, I think it's one part of um, your story, uh, I think, is a very... Um, common tale, which is that the, the board leader is the uh, it's kind of like when we ask for volunteers, the person who steps backwards the slowest becomes the next board president. Mm -hmm. um, and so in some cases it is that. It's kind of, okay, who's, who's right. least willing or, or, or least uh, quick on turning down the job? Um, but you all did do uh, a, a thoughtful process to the extent that you were able and that you let your board know well in advance 
that you were going to finish your, your term as president, um, but that mm -hmm. it was essential that they choose someone um, mm -hmm. earlier rather than later. And so that, that seemed like that was one of the critical things that you did that pushed the board and maybe fu the future board mm -hmm. president into, into doing something. And I really didn't want to serve my last year as president and then just be gone. Mm -hmm. And I do think it was very valuable for me to be stepped down in June, and I'm still on for a year, so I'm kind of our presence, you know, come to person when there's something, and I can be used as a resource. I'm just not out of the picture, and that seems to help be helping our, um, oh, what's the word? Smooth transition, maybe? Uh-huh, nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope you'll mention that again when we come into sort of how we think about the possible ways of training um, successors, because that's a real critical mm -hmm. piece of what has worked for you all. Um, Carolyn, from the other side of stuff, someone mm -hmm. somewhere along the way um, identified you, or maybe you identified yourself, mm -hmm. um, but what, what happened on your board that got you to at least be considering being the next board president? Um, well, the, the then current president of my first year on the board sent me an email and asked me if I would consider being the vice president. I, I would not have put my name forward in large part because I was just newly on the board and didn't um, think about reaching towards that type of a goal. Um, but the current president, and during my first term, or my first year, um, sent me an email and, um, and I just said I would you know, be honored to do it. And then I became the vice president my second year. And then in, that, in my second year, it was a different board president um, but her and I, you know, I basically followed her around, and we can get to that more later, like you're saying, Michael, in terms of um, preparation. Um, but that, that's, how it, that's how it went. I was vice president then last year and then stepped into the role. So it's slightly different. So for, for Mary Pat, as president, you said, Mary Pat, hey, I'm not going to do this anymore. Someone else needs to step forward and kind of put it out to the group. Mm -hmm. Whereas for you, Carolyn, what I'm hearing is that the current board president personally asked you or said mm -hmm. to you, hey, mm -hmm. what do you think? Why don't you consider this? Mm -hmm. um, so two very different ways of approaching this, um, mm -hmm. and maybe that's situational. Maybe it depends on uh, who's on the board, um, but I think it's helpful for us to consider these, these two possibilities. Um, Marshall, I'm wondering if you would take a moment just um, giving us some, some of your own insights, maybe from your own experience of either being uh, board president or, or thinking about a successor on your own board, um, what, what happens if there's not an obvious choice or no one steps up immediately? Um, what, what are some of the options? You know, Michael, when, um, when we were putting this together, one of the things that I was thinking about, you mentioned a parallel <clears throat> earlier to, um, you know, to um, the board is a servant leader and the president is a servant leader. And I think that there's another parallel here, approaching a reluctant successor to, um, <clears throat> to your and Marilyn's presentation on board recruitment. Um, what do we do when we approach a reluctant nominee? Um, suppose we identify somebody whom, whom we feel um, would make a good uh, a board member, but he or he is not quite ready to uh, to step up and you know maybe even a little bit reluctant. So you know when we put these slides together, I was thinking about that as well, and I think that there are are, are some parallels. Certainly, it's the sort of a thing that we probably not want to bring up right in the board meeting. I mean, we certainly need to talk about um, the existence of the need for um, for a board president. We you know we may not. Um, necessarily want to turn to somebody who has no idea that it's about to happen and say, well, um, Joan or John, how would you like to be president? You, you'd probably be great. Um, rather than doing that, I think it, it's, you know, it's probably better to arrange to talk privately um, and you know, do a combination of perhaps education and, and a little flattery as well. Um, you know, explain why that person would be a good board person. Um, that person may not have even been thinking about it up till now. Um, 
um, they, you know, if, if that person hasn't had a whole lot of experience as a board leader or, or as a leader at all, she or he may not have been even thinking about what constitutes a good leader, may not even realize, well, yeah, I have leadership qualities. So um, in this private talk, you'd really want to explain what you're seeing, say why um, she or he would make a good board president. Um, um, be sure that that the you know that the person understands that she or he won't be alone. We've you know we've just talked about that. Talked about the the ongoing support that um, the present board president can 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 provide. Now, you um, know, as you're as you're talking, Marshall, I'm thinking we've we've called this the reluctant successor, but in a sense, it's it's um, not necessarily someone who is consciously holding back, but someone who might not have just thought about moving forward into the leadership position. And so it's really just that that personal touch maybe kind of, you know, in a sense maybe, Carolyn, you could have thought of yourself as the reluctant successor, someone who wasn't thinking about it independently until approached by uh, the current president. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And for some people, of course, as soon as they hear that, you know, something clicks. A light bulb goes, mm -hmm. goes on. And they said, of course. Why didn't I think of that? Uh -huh. um, and yeah. so, so sometimes they're not really as reluctant. I've certainly seen that happen. Um, you know, sometimes a, a person, um, I've seen instances on my own board where, <clears throat> where very qualified people um, came on the board and it was immediately clear to me um, that they'd be a good board person very, very quickly. And just a little bit of, of discussion um, was really enough to, I won't, I won't even say convince that person. In some cases, the person said, yeah, I'd love to do this. I just need some help. And, uh, and I've, of course, said, I will provide all the help that you need. Um, well, let's just leave it at that, as, as um, uh, that there are, there's at least now tonight one example, Carolyn, you're mentioning where someone made the personal suggestion to you and that that's a good place to start. Um, and just to keep in mind that if there's not an obvious successor, that doesn't mean that there's not someone on the board who could fill that role. What I want to um, segue into a little bit here is uh, that there are a lot of ways that a board and a board president can create opportunities for people to try out leadership in smaller ways uh, or in simpler ways other than taking on the president's role. Um, we've mentioned some here. And um, I wonder if, if uh, first, Marshall, if you would just real quick mention maybe on your own board there at La Montanita, um, what are the, some of the, the leadership opportunities that happen on your board that aren't necessarily the board officer roles? Well, you know, for us and, and actually for a number of the other boards that I've worked, worked for as well, I think our first um, um, selection here chairing the committee is a is a big one. It's a great opportunity to take on some responsibility, and um, it's also a good option because even though it's taking on responsibility on kind of a smaller scale to see that the um, that the committee gets its work done, but it's usually well defined, or at least you know at a minimum we ought to be sure it's well defined. So if um, if if we're asking somebody or suggesting that somebody chair a committee. We want to be sure that the committee's work is well defined. Um, we want to be sure that you know that the the the, um, uh, the committee ideally will have a charter describing what the outcome is and, and and any of the other details associated with it. I think the chairing a committee is um, probably one of the best ones to to do. The the other good one that we've listed here that that I've seen um, really develop leaders is um, uh, leading a board study discussion. And this can go deeper than simply leading the discussion. It, it involves planning the discussion as well, where, where we decide, well, um, you know, we need to select a topic. And how does that topic fit into our current plan of study? <clears throat> and what kind of research do I need to do to, uh, um, to find the right topic? Um, and, and how am I going to frame the discussion and lead people and um, have and people imagine, understand how it relates? I, I think that you could imagine that very much like what a board president might do when there's a topic on an agenda to think about how do I introduce this agenda item, how do I help the board start the conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let me just check real quick before we move on to other stuff. Um, 
Carolyn, were there particular um, or are there particular opportunities on your board where people can step up and take some sort of leadership role besides the presidency? Well, I think that the, um, the opportunities that are on the slide are the same opportunities that we have on our on our board right now. So there's nothing else I would have to add to that. Okay. Um, Mary Pat, is there anything that we haven't mentioned here that you, you've seen in your own experience? No, I don't believe so. I agree with Carol. It's pretty much uh, opportunities of committee and leading discussions and so on. All right. You've covered it. Um, so these are the basics. Um, you know, there may be other things on specific boards, um, but we, we just uh, wanted to mention there are, some, there are some obvious ones that are true for most boards. Um, when we think about um, training, uh, one of the things that I just wanted to mention here is an idea that um, I learned from uh, my wife, Deborah, who is a, a teacher. She years ago um, taught me about this idea of model, lead, test. Um, and, and there are some really obvious um, places where uh, a current leader, a current board president, could use this particular framework to think about how to train someone who's, who's going to take over the role. Um, the, the model, um, let, let's take this, a simple example like um, how you go about creating an agenda. Um, it's not necessarily um, rocket science, as they say, uh, but it's a critical part of helping a board function, having a good agenda that makes sense, that flows, so that the meetings are functional and enjoyable, and that the board is clearly accomplishing um, its agreed upon uh, tasks. Um, an agenda is a really important thing. Making an agenda is not something that many people have had experience doing if they haven't already been the leader of a group. And so modeling is sitting down with a person um, and saying, hey, here's the agenda I've created. Maybe, maybe you're, doing, you're describing it as you write it out, or maybe you're just going over it after you've written. Here's what I've done. Here's why I chose what I chose. Here's why I put this item here and not there. Here's why I gave this item five minutes instead of 30 minutes. Um, whatever it might be, but describing the, the process um, as you're doing it. The second step in this kind of training is, is lead, which is, um, again, with this uh, example of an agenda creation, is to say to the person, all right, your turn you get to write an agenda, except I'll be there beside you as you do it. I'll answer your questions. I'll help you figure things out that are puzzling. Um, but I'll be, I'll be right beside you as you are doing this particular job. Uh, that, that process of, of guiding someone through the, the work itself um, is their first chance to learn by doing, but to have full support. Um, and I think that, uh, that both but they're all Marshall, Carolyn, and Mary Pat mentioned this idea of being able to support people as they start their work. Um, and finally, in this kind of this framework of teaching, the, the final step is the test, which is that um, some meeting, it's just that person's job to write the agenda. Um, no, no feedback until, um, as with anyone else, uh, would give feedback after the meeting. Let them write the agenda. Let them. Uh, structure the meeting, and then afterwards go back and then debrief. What did we learn from that? What worked? What didn't work? Um, I, I really love this framework uh, model, lead, test. And I just wanted to mention it as um, something that we could think about in any um, aspect of training a successor. Um, one of the uh, other things to think about in terms of training is those outside opportunities um, beyond what goes on in, in the board room itself. Um, we have, through the CBUILD program, the, the 101 uh, sessions that happened periodically uh, around the country and throughout the year. Um, and those are good groundings in fundamental uh, governance uh, roles and responsibilities. The other one that I know everyone on the call tonight has been part of um, is the uh, CCMA, um, which happens, again, uh, around the country once a year, a great chance to learn from other board leaders. Um, a couple I wanted to mention here that are um, specific, uh, well, the other one that's specific to the, the CBIL program um, 
Carolyn and Mary Pat both have the, or had for Mary Pat, the opportunity to have regular check-in consultant calls with their Seabuilt consultant, and including the the board successor or potential successor in some or all of those calls is a great time, a great opportunity for that person to learn about the kind of uh, issues that the board president is working on, the kind of solutions that they might consider. And it's also a training um, that helping them understand that there is support out there for their work, that they don't have to go it alone. And that's a big part of the, the Seabuilt program. Um, and then finally, this other one that I mentioned um, is that when uh, the board presidents, uh, as many presidents um, ha are authorized to do, they can represent the board or the co-op uh, in the community. Maybe it's at an annual meeting, maybe it's out in a, in a public forum of some sort. Um, but to uh, shadow the board president or to accompany um, or to maybe be the delegated um, rep representative to the community. Um, so ag again, I'll just go back to um, Mary Pat and Carolyn and Marshall, um, are there opportunities that you have seen um, or, or experienced yourself outside of the regular board meetings or the board functions that um, might be places, chances for someone to learn a bit more about board leadership? Mary Pat, what do you think? Well, I, the ones that are on the slide, indeed, um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else there where I was thinking that it would be a good opportunity for our present elect. And there may have been an opportunity out there that we missed that hasn't come to me yet. But um, I can't think of one actually right off the top of my head. Attending the, the training, of course, and CCM, which both those he did, sitting in the calls, we had some meetings, he did some agendas. Um, there wasn't an opportunity in the community to go address somebody or whatever that came up during that year. So I think that's about it. You know, I do, I do remember that when Matt was getting closer to becoming the actual president, that um, at that point he started participating in some of the calls that you and I had set up. The, the yes. Calls. Oh, and he also started participating in the weekly and biweekly meetings that I was having with the board, uh, with the manager, the general uh, manager. Uh -huh. We would generally meet every week or two, depending on what was happening, and spend an hour or so talking. And you know, I was, you know, if there was something substantial that came down in a call with you or with the GM, I would write something up for the board. But generally, it was just kind of a check-in. And he did that a few times, too. In fact, he sat in without me a couple of times. All right. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, Kellen, is there anything that, that hasn't been mentioned already that you've seen as a good training opportunity? Well, I'd really like to um, stress how, how important those monthly consultant calls were. Um, for a whole year, I sat in on those calls. Um, Marilyn Scholl is our consultant, and, and I just want to just say how absolutely valuable that was for me as vice president to prepare me for my role now. Um, in terms of the shadowing, um, I feel like um, our past president, when I was vice president, she CC'd me on most every one of her emails that either she had, you know, between the GM or even other board members, again, so that I would have a sense of, you know, just where the board president's role was um, within, within all that, and I'll also understand a little bit more about the depth of the co-op. And then the third thing was um, our agenda planning meetings. We actually met once a month, and then I would be on, in on those meetings, too, where we would plan, plan the agenda. So I feel like those three things were extremely helpful to prepare me to be present this year. Nice. And, and so that's a good uh, reminder that we don't necessarily have to do everything, all these ideas. You don't necessarily have to pile them all in, um, but that a few of them well chosen and well used can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. and, and I also um, appreciate that you're saying that for you, being part of those monthly consultant calls throughout a whole year made a big difference. Whereas you know, Mary Pat, your experience or Matt's experience as the current board president was that he started participating in that only just before becoming president. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I right. myself think you know doing it for a longer period of time is very valuable. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's what what makes sense for the people involved, who has what what the time is, what the uh, resources 
are. Um, but any 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 of these things you can take part of are going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. You um, know, Michael and yeah, uh, Marshall. Go and ahead. Another thing, some other things that come to mind um, about outside work that we 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 haven't addressed yet that people might think about is um, <clears throat> ha having the identified future board leader start reviewing important board documents. Mm -hmm. um, is you know make sure that the, the 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 board leader looks at our agreements, at the board calendar, the bylaws, the budget, any of the any of the important governance documents, and begins to begins to become familiar because of course those are the those are the tools that the the, uh, the president will need to help guide the co-op. Okay. So starting that that outside review of those documents would probably be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's probably not a, a bad thing to do with uh, someone who's just thinking about coming into that role might look at those documents with a fresh eye and might notice things that have even slipped through the cracks. Mm -hmm. uh, but just to take a moment and say, let's just let's do a review. Let's see what's there. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that I thought I'd, I'd, I'd mention too, um, you know, an, an example of where um, the person in training could um, be working with the owners is is the annual meeting. Um, frequently, although not always, um, it's um, the, the board president has an important role in the annual meeting, and um, that role could be shared partly with the with the person in training, so it'd be a good opportunity to interact with, with owners in that way. Definitely. Nice. Um, I wanted to just uh, not spend too much time about this, just it's kind of a reminder that all of us on a board are always supposed to be responsible for everything, um, but in, in particular, um, the board president uh, still has a special role. And Carolyn, you reminded me, um, I hadn't even thought about it until you mentioned that your own um, board has a, 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 a uh, let's see if I can make this open up, whoops, um, has a policy about the, that the board president is responsible for thinking about leadership. And I just wanted to um, point out that in the, the C-Build um, template policies, um, we have this uh, suggestion that the president in particular is planning for perpetuation. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wonder now, um, Carolyn, you're uh, you know, relatively new at the job. Um, and you, your board has this agreement that this is your, one of your roles. Um, have you started thinking about this already? What um, do you think well, you'll do with it? Um, this, um, going through these slides has made me realize that I need to um, do it sooner, sooner than later. Um, you know, get right on that, even starting at our next meeting. Um, the president plans for the perpetuation of the officers, but I think it's also important to stress, and you do in these slides as well, is that it's the, the board then, though, that you know actually elects the officers. So the president might may suggest, as in my case was true, that you know that I be vice president and then president. But it's really important to have complete board agreement around that. Um, yeah, that, that's right. a good reminder that, that mm -hmm. we're, we, aren't, we aren't talking about uh, installing a, a puppet dictator. We're, we're <laughs> talking about just planning for <laughs> leadership succession here. But ultimately, mm -hmm. we're, we still live in a, and work in a democratic society here in our co-ops. Mm -hmm. And so the board will choose its own leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I just want to uh, quickly mention that um, a board could consider that the vice president is a president-elect. Um, I, I think that when you all, Mary Pat uh, at Marquette, thought about this, you thought of them as two separate roles. Is that right? Uh, yes, we did. Yeah. The vice president in our um, bylaws is the person who operates in the absence of the president, you know, and runs the meeting and so on if something happens with the president, but is not running for or is not basically prepping for election as president. So if this is um, some boards could uh, design the vice president's role as a, a training for a successor position, again, still contingent on being elected to the president later on. Um, the vice president doesn't have to be the presidential successor. Um, they, they can be 
a completely different role. Um, but what we'd like to encourage folks to do is to be conscious about it. Um, if you if you are assuming that the vice president is the president-elect, then say that, make that your agreement. This is what we're working on. Um, don't just let that continue on unsaid. Um, the next several slides, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over the details. Um, these are things that uh, you all as attendees uh, can go back to later and just look at this as, as a, uh, a sample, a, a beginning of an idea of how you might think about your own um, timing, your own process, your own structure for thinking about succession for your board. Um, you know, as you just said, Carolyn, I hope this is a reminder for you as board president to start mm -hmm. thinking about that, to start mm -hmm. taking some action. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't want to try to tell people, um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be punished and, and uh, you know, uh, totally uh, humiliated in public if you don't go about doing this stuff right now or that you don't do it this way. But just we're trying to raise awareness that mm -hmm. um, this is something for, for all of us in leadership positions to be thinking about. How do we continue that? How do we make sure that there, there aren't these gaps? So this is just a, a, a quick, um, again, a quick summary of one way to go about it. I did want to um, show one thing that, uh, let me see, I think it was this one um, that came from uh, Mary Pat. Uh, this is something that you put together. Um, I edited it just slightly to make it a little bit mm -hmm. more generic. but. Um, this is uh, something that you wrote up for your successor, for, for the next president, Matt. And I wonder if you could just real quick give us um, a, a, just your quick insight on, on what it took to put this together and how useful you think this document has been to your new president. Um, it didn't take a long time to put together. I just basically over a couple of months started thinking, well, what is it, what all is it that I do? And so I just, you know, kind of came up with this list and added a few to it as time went on. Um, the interesting thing is that a lot, a couple things have gotten missed here and there because we are, haven't got a perfect system by any means. Uh -huh. But um, Matt is taking this and kind of doing things differently, his own way. So some things that I did, like writing a monthly column for the newsletter or bi-monthly as the newsletter has changed. Um, he's asking people for some volunteers to write things up, you know, this sort of thing, which uh -huh. is, you know, just his his take on it. And um, the main thing is that it's kind of a reminder if, if you or, or as president aren't going to do this, then, you know, somebody else needs to do it, yeah. basically. And um, I think it kind of looks like a lot of stuff, <laughs> but a lot of it is yeah. very, you know, it's a once a year thing or, you know, it's something you can delegate. So, uh -huh. um, And I had asked him um, if he would let me know if there was something I had missed or whatever just so that I could um, talk about it, and he hadn't gotten back to me, so I'm assuming that he didn't have anything. So it must have been good enough, huh? Well, I hope so. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, I really, I really liked it when I, I saw it. I thought, what a, what a nice gift to give to the person who's coming next. It's not saying, uh, telling a person what they have to do or how to do their job, but just saying, hey, here's, here's a list of the things I've been covering, and keep this, keep this in mind. Use it as a beginning place, and right. as you said, each board president gets to, to a large extent anyway, create their own job um, within the within the bounds of what the board has asked mm -hmm. for. And so here's where you figured out a lot of details about what you do, and then your mm -hmm. successor can figure out which of these to continue on and which of these to delegate out. So anyway, I thought it was a nice a nice way to present this information to a successor. So thank you for well, thank offering that. Oh, thank you. Um, so let's um, not spend more time on process except to um, give a chance just to check in real quick. We're going to close out our session here in just a few minutes. Um, Mark, were there any questions that haven't been um, answered that you wanted to uh, toss out for us before we get ready to close? You have answered the questions that have been asked. That is so good to know. That, that sort <laughs> of uh, <Perfect. There> you <coughs> uh, intuition is, is amazing. Um, <laughs> 
Well, Marsha, we're going to um, use this then as a chance to uh, get ready to close out. Before you summarize the, the um, material for us, the presentation for us, I wonder, um, I want to just give uh, Caroline and then Mary Pat a chance if you have any last quick thoughts on um, a suggestion or insight you have that you'd like to make sure other people hear. Carolyn, what do you think? Any, anything that you haven't been able to say already? Um, I think um, the thing, again, that I started with at the beginning, um, and I guess I'll end with now, that this webinar has really taught me is how important it is to have a plan for board leadership. And while I feel like our co-op has done a really good job, and I do feel like I was well trained for the position, um, I don't think we really defined it so much as a plan, per se. It just naturally evolved. And um, again, I just want to go back to those first slides and, and restress how important it is for the board president to be thinking about a plan for his or her succession. Nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary Pat, any last thoughts before we close out our evening? Not much, except I echo Carolyn because I hadn't even stopped to started to think that you know this should be kind of like an ongoing thing. That yes, now our current president should be thinking of this. And um, mm -hmm. the other thing, and perhaps we'll answer this in some future webinar. It seems to me that the time and effort that goes into training a president, um, I really like the thought that a president would stay on longer than a year or two. Mm -hmm. It just it seems like to do that every year. And I don't know if you and Marshall have any great ideas on that. Um, which would be if a vice president was going to always be the next president, you would have a turnover every year. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I, you know, I guess that's another time question for another time, wondering how boards deal with that. Yeah. And um, because the whole succession thing is, it's it's a it's a great deal of work, I think. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing process, and mm -hmm. you know, and as Michael has suggested, there's no one good way to do it. There's, you know, depending on your board's needs and who's on your board, their plans. There, there are going to be several mm -hmm. ways to approach it. Mm -hmm. um, I want to just real quick um, before you do the uh, a final um, wrap up here, Marshall, is is again remind people that there was the earlier um, online workshop that Marilyn Scholl and I presented about. Uh, board perpetuation, and what I don't want to do is leave anyone with the sense that, oh my gosh, now there's a ton more work to do that I hadn't thought of before today, and I've got to run out and do all this extra stuff. Um, but what we'd really like you to be thinking about is, as leaders of your cooperative, and then beyond that, as leaders within the board, how do we maintain leadership? How do we make sure that our co-op always has qualified, dedicated people in those positions to help continue holding the flame for us and guiding us into the future. Um, so it begins with recruiting people onto the board who are qualified to be in that leadership position. And then from that group there, uh, training, offering opportunities for and recruiting people into the board president's role. Um, it's just it's a it's a mindset as, an awareness as much as anything else, um, but not necessarily a, a list of of tasks that should take up a lot of time and effort. So I just wanted to tie back to that earlier um, presentation. And I wonder, Marshall, if you can just um, quickly help us um, wrap up and and uh, close out the the presentation. Just a couple of quick things, Michael. If, if I don't know if we can find the desired outcomes, just flip back to one of those earliest. The, the earliest slides, just to, to very briefly review that, to look and uh, see those overview planning board desired outcome. Yeah. But uh, we don't need to, to 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 go through them. But just as a reminder, this is what we hope um, you've experienced that these outcomes have happened for you, and to suggest that you know that if you've got most of what you want, but there are still um, you know a few gaps there, talk to your C build consultant. And the CBUILD consultants are all familiar with this work, and they can help fill in any of the gaps. Um, I, I, you know, I'd like to thank our guests and um, 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 for for all their help. You've been, you've both been great. Really, really thanks. Um, thanks everybody for being here. Thanks to Mark for his help as well. Um, one last thing is we want to hear from you what you you know what you thought of of um, the presentation, 
And so uh, Michael here, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but um, shortly after we sign off, immediately after we sign off, you should be seeing um, an evaluation. It should pop up at the end. And we'd really like to hear from you about um, how you feel about the presentation. It'll help us improve it. And um, um, that, that's important for all of us. Great. Thank you so much, Marshall. Mm -hmm. And Carolyn and Mary Pat, thank you both so much. I will mm -hmm. follow through with you um, tomorrow just to, uh, again, thank you for your time here. Mm -hmm. And um, this, then, is the official uh, closing of our presentation tonight. Um, thank you all for coming, and we look forward to finding you on another presentation in the future.